Good afternoon and welcome to the CRNNL session on professionalism and social media. My name is Peggy Rauman and I am one of the three nursing consultants for policy and practice and with me is... Um, hi everyone, I'm Michelle Carpenter and as Peggy said, I'm a nursing consultant with policy and practice. So in today's presentation, we are going to focus on professionalism and how professionalism is tied to nursing practice. And then we're going to link how professionalism can be impacted by social media. So in today's healthcare setting, there are numerous complex and intersecting factors that influences professionalism in the nursing profession. So looking at this picture, you can see some uh, professional nurses. But there are a lot of contextual factors in, um, within the workplace that affects professionalism of nurses. There are technological advances. Um, there are issues with um, professional issues such as staffing and workload. Nurses face uh, bullying um, and burnout sometimes. And there's also very um, difficult situations such as uh, with medical assistance and dying and things that nurses have to deal with. So what does that mean for nurses? The point we're trying to make here is that regardless of extenuating circumstances in your work setting or professional practice issues, your level of professionalism needs to remain the same. There is a regulatory expectation for you to ma maintain your professional presence at all times. So we are one of many uh, professions that must always demonstrate professionalism. And we have a document um, called Professionalism, um, and that was developed based on RN feedback. And in this document, we define professionalism as adherence in all roles and practice settings to the CRNNL standards of practice, and it includes behaviors, qualities, values, and attitudes that demonstrate that an RN is accountable, knowledgeable, visible, and ethical. Now, the CRNNL doesn't just draft these definitions and documents on our own. We uh, always uh, look for input from uh, registrants, and the defin this definition of pro professionalism was drafted by a committee of peers who worked together on this definition for um, a number of years, about a year and a half. So where do these expectations um, from our definition come from? So uh, there's three documents on this slide. We have our standards of practice, our entry level competencies, and our code of ethics. Our standards of practice, as you know, are broad and principle-based authoritative statements that articulate the conduct or performance required of an RN. They, further, they serve further to define the responsibilities nurses have as set out in legislation or law and regulation. And the primary purpose of the standards is to identify the level of performance expected of all RNs in their practice against which actual performance can be measured. RNs are responsible for understanding their standards and applying them to their practice. In our standards of practice document, Standard 3, Indicator 3.1, uh, states that we demonstrate um, a professional presence and model a professional behavior. This is also an entry-level competency under Professional Responsibility and Accountability Indicator uh, 5. In the entry-level competencies, there are um, 101 competencies grouped under nine roles. Um, under, the competence, under the role of Communicator, uh, 3.1 says that we are to introduce ourselves by first and uh, last name of professional uh, designation. And under the role of Professional, um, 2.2 Professionalism, we engage in reflective practice. So we reflect on our standards, our code of ethics, and competence, competencies to demonstra and demonstrate behaviors verbal and nonverbal that articulate a professional presence. So in order to help maintain good practice and prevent poor practice, we put these expectations for professionalism in a document. And it helps you really to remember um, what these expectations are and where they come from. So remembering our definition of professionalism as adherence in all roles and practice settings to the CRNNL uh, standards of practice and it includes behaviors, qualities, values, attributes that demonstrate that an RN is accountable, knowledgeable, visible, and ethical. So the first of those four attributes that we're going to talk about is being visible. A 
And part of our reflective practice is to reflect on being visible. In this reflection, your appearance matters. So our end strive for professionalism in all aspects of care and interactions. First impressions are often formed in an instant. So how a nurse appears can have a significant impact on how a patient perceives a nurse. And that comes from a research study that was conducted in uh, 2016. So contributing to, quality, to a quality patient experience, applying evidence-based practice support changes, we can um, apply evidence-based practice to support changes in nursing dress code policies. So the results of lots of um, research has found that the standardization of nursing uniforms in our healthcare system can have a positive impact on patient experience by promoting a consistent professional image and by helping patients to identify our end care providers. So let's consider if these Im images reflect a professional presence. So like we said in, in the earlier slides, we work in a variety of practice setting in a variety of roles, and they can be clinical or non-clinical. However, regardless of where you practice, um, the expectations for professionalism remain the same. So these images actually came from uh, just a Google search on the internet. And the only purpose of this is to get you to reflect on what do these images say about the nursing profession? What do they say about uh, the knowledge and skills and abilities of RNs? Do they tell you anything about what RNs know? Um, so just, and then think about the, reflect on the clients and the context. What would a person, um, you, you have to be aware of your, your visibility in specific context. What would a person with the dementia think about a busy uniform? What purpose is the, you know, the secret Santa um, nurse displaying? What kind of visible image is presented by the, the long sleeves with the thumb hole. So, you know, is this in, does this represent a nurse that washes her hands? Um, and what does the camouflage um, uniform say? Um, that you don't want to be found or that you're, you know, gearing up to go into battle to do a dressing. So there's a lot of literature that states that professional influence um, professional image influences a client's perception of caregivers um, and that it only takes um, a few seconds for a person um, within a second up to 12 seconds that a patient will assess an RN's professional identity, attitude, mood, and character attributes such as a level of trustworthiness based on their outward appearance and other nonverbal cues. So these images in no way reflect the RN's knowledge level. Um, they could be the absolute best nurses out there and have um, lots of knowledge, skills, and abilities, and they could be very, very caring. Um, but we all know that first impression is critically important for establishing the therapeutic nurse-client relationship. So we often get a lot of backlash when we have this uh, slide up about freedom of expression and being able to, you know, uh, wear uh, what you want at work. Um, so my answer to this is that RNs demonstrate commitment to their caring client center practice by recognizing that the needs of the client are more important than their need for self-expression um, in the workplace. Um, so these are just, like I mentioned earlier, we're not only, we're not the only um, self-regulated profession or professions that, um, you know, have to think about their visibility. Um, so many professionals are held to the same uh, visibility standards. And these are just some professional images taken off of uh, the internet again. There's one of a judge and there's a, one of a physician or a nurse practitioner, one of a pilot and one of a police officer. Um, and these professional images are presented to you to demonstrate how your image uh, or your visibility can demonstrate a presence, can demonstrate a voice, um, it can demonstrate a skill, um, and it can demonstrate decision-making power. So a nurse's uniform are their nonverbal um, conscious statement that nurses have the skills and knowledge to care for others. 
So we dress for respect. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, it's also um, visibility for the clients helps decrease um, anxiety for um, for the patients if they are looking for a nurse to provide their care. So patients have been found to experience frustration and embarrassment when they cannot locate their RN and mistakenly seek medical information or assistance from non-nursing personnel. So it is very important for RNs to be recognizable, especially within the hospital setting. And the Registered Nurses Union in Newfoundland and Labrador have the Clarity Project uh, where they um, established um, how to become more visible in nursing with their uniform. And the CRNNL of always. So remembering in our previous slide of the definition of professionalism, uh, the four behaviors are uh, that our ends are accountable, knowledgeable, visible, and ethical. So we've already talked about visible a little bit, but identifying oneself as an RN is our assurance to the public that we have the knowledge, skills, ability, and authority to practice as an RN. RN NNP is a protected title. Only those with a practicing license can use this title. RNs must introduce themselves by first and last name and professional de designation. And this is on page three of our professionalism document, and it is also an entry level competency. Under accountable, so what does it mean for RNs uh, when we say accountable? Well, we're accountable for what we do as well as what we choose not to do for our actions and inactions, judgments, consequences, and outcomes of those decisions. We are, we are accountable to acknowledge and uphold the professional, ethical, and legal aspects of nursing practice, to adhere to our standards of practice, code of ethics, legislation or law, and organizational policies, and to participate in a continuing competence program and the audit if we are called. We are also accountable to be reflective practitioners. So, we are accountable for our own practice and to do what is in the best interest of our patients. We are knowledgeable to use evidence of form best practiced, to be critical thinkers, to maintain competence and attain new knowledge through participation in reflective practice and lifelong learning and continued competence. We have a professional obligation to attend information and training sessions to learn new things because learning new things and keeping up with technology is in the best interest of our client. Our ends are also ethical. So we acknowledge the importance of upholding the public's trust in the individual RN, as well as the nursing profession as a whole. We adhere to legal and moral obligations related to privacy and confidentiality. Um, so we uphold the client's right to determine access to their healthcare information. We conduct ourselves in a manner that supports collegial and professional relationships and recognize that expectations for professional behavior extend beyond the workplace or work hours in certain circumstances. Our ends are moral agents acting in the best interest of the client to do what is right and good and to conduct themselves ethically in what they do and how they interact with clients. And Michelle's now going to take over and uh, take you through some reflections about professionalism. So the first reflection um, that I want you to uh, consider is, is it, it is important that my knowledge is evident in my practice. So knowledge provides the basis for a professional practice and enables the nursing profession to define the nature of opportunities in nursing to help them problem solve and identify solutions, make autonomous and collaborative uh, decisions, and use discretion and critical thinking and professional judgment within your nursing practice. The registered nurse and nurse practitioner is expected to use evidence-informed knowledge, skills, and judgment, and follow up and advocate for best practice. Evidence-informed knowledge can also inform the RN when selecting appropriate attire to demonstrate a professional presence or image um, and determine what articulates professionalism and it also defines the parameters for a therapeutic nurse-client relationship. The next reflection is the way I communicate to clients and families um, and colleagues matter. So professional communication is extremely important in um, nursing um, practice. And um, under standard four, professional uh, relationships and leadership, indicator 4.3 says communicates effectively and um, 
effectively and respectfully when other, with other team members to promote uh, continuity and the delivery of safe, competent, compassionate, and ethical care. And we often hear um, the saying that nurses eat their young. So in nursing, socialization is recognized as more than just acquiring the skills and knowledge necessary to perform a role and includes acquiring an understanding of the values and norms that are fundamental to the essence of the profession. So RNs, as a result, have a responsibility to contribute to quality practice environments and to positively influence the transition of, of uh, beginning practitioners. And we even have a standard that um, talks about that nurse, nurses support clients, colleagues, and students by sharing nursing knowledge and expertise by acting as an effective role model, resource, preceptor, or mentor. So it's really important that we think about our uh, therapeutic nurse-client relationships, our documentation on our collaboration, and how we communicate in those interactions. So the next one is my client comes first. So a professional presence requires the RN to engage in reflective practice. And as nurses, we need to reflect and determine if we can say that with, with uh, certainty that my client um, comes first. Can I say that everything that I do as an RN is in the best interest of the client? And to speak to that, we also have a, a couple of indicators under standard three, client-centered practice, that speaks to that. And uh, indicator 3.2 says that the RN and MP is responsible to apply a client-centered practice approach to their nursing practice. And 3.3 says communicates effectively and respectfully with clients to promote continuity and this delivery of safe, competent, compassionate, and ethical care. The next thing that we're going to talk about is therapeutic nurse client uh, I'm sorry, therapeutic communication. And we have a um, document that outlines the expectations for registered nurses and nurse practitioners when engaging in therapeutic nurse client relationships. And therapeutic communication is a, a part of nursing practice and demonstrates professionalism, as we've said. Um, and so here in this slide, there's a picture of our document, and you can find our document on our document library under resources and publications, or, um, and then click on document library. And you'll find this under our uh, interpretive documents. So a therapeutic nurse-client relationship is a planned, time-limited, and goal-directed connection between an RN and a client for the purpose of meeting the client's health care needs. It has a defined period of time to achieve health-related treatment goals, and it has a beginning, a middle, and an end, and can and should be meaningful to the client. So it's really important to clue in on that time frame for a therapeutic, therapeutic nurse-client relationship because it will help you to reflect on um, when you in, encounter clients through through um, social media, or if you um, meet them in um, the grocery store. So just keep that in the back of your mind as we um, go through our, our reflections. And therapeutic nurse-client relationships are fundamental for providing safe, competent, compassionate, and ethical nursing care. And communication ther theorists state that it only takes four minutes for the average person who meets a stranger to determine whether they want to um, engage in any further interaction. And a caring and trustworthy attitude and behavior is required to develop rapport. So um, it's really important that we consider quarter talk among nurses. Um, I'm sure um, the client doesn't need to know about uh, your busy morning. So if you're in the, in the quarter and you're um, talking to your colleague that, you know, saying that how busy it is here this morning. I don't think we're going to get, um, you know, a break here. Um, we'll run off our feet. Then the client who's in the bed hearing this uh, from the corridor um, may hesitate to ring the buzzer if they need assistance to get to the washroom or um, they need assistance with reaching, you know, their glass of water on their bedside. So, you know, we have to reflect on should we be um, communicating uh, these things in the quarter? Because is that in the best interest of the client? Um, so we want to talk about some, I guess, some interactions that occur uh, in therapeutic nurse-client relationships. And um, 
you know, how that reflects professionalism. And I guess one of the main themes that we need to, I guess, um, reflect on in therapeutic communication is that RNs and MPs are responsible and accountable to establish and maintain professional boundaries. And, and a couple examples um, that I want to give you um, reflect on, is the nurse able to establish and maintain a professional uh, boundary with their clients? So example, gift giving. And um, oftentimes nurses receive um, a coffee or a box of chocolates um, from the family in appreciation or from the client in appreciation for the care uh, and the quality care that you've provided for that, that um, client and family. Um, but um, when uh, is it not appropriate to accept a gift? And it is not, and in our document, Therapeutic Nurse-Client Relationship on page 12, you'll, you'll have, there's a scenario there and there's an answer to that question. It is not appropriate for an RN to accept or receive a gift if there's a client expectation that a different level or nature of care will be provided by the RN. If accepting or receiving gifts will have an impact on the client's significant others or if the client will feel obligated to provide gifts to or expect to receive gifts from other members of the healthcare team, then we need to reflect on, is that really appropriate to expect, um, you know, to accept a gift? So we're not saying that you can't, absolutely not. What we're saying is that, you know, if that family member expects you to wash their mom before others because they provided a coffee or a box of chocolates, then you may want to reflect on whether you should accept that. And then accepting a friend request on Facebook. Um, so that's, that often, um, Nurses are, uh, encounter that ethical dilemma of whether they should. Um, but when you think about um, accepting a friend request on Facebook from a client or former client, registered nurses are expected to avoid engaging in personal social media relationships with clients and should consider should they deny friend requests on, on Facebook from current clients. Befriending clients through your personal Facebook page opens the potential for boundary violations. It extends the Aryan scope of professional responsibility and opens uh, opportunities for breaches and confidentiality. And RNs are legally and ethically bound to maintain professional uh, boundaries, appropriate professional boundaries with clients. And accepting a, uh, a request could transition the relationship from personal, professional to personal, thus causing the boundaries of the relationship to become blurred. So at the end of the day, it's your accountability to reflect on whether you accept that friend request. Not saying that you can't, but you must be able to be conscientious and determine, um, you know, or prevent that blurring of professional boundaries. So there's our reflection, as I said, should you accept a friend request on Facebook from a client? And uh, we're going to come back to it um, at the at the end. And after you've heard all of the, I guess, evidence that we've provided, we want you to reflect on further whether it's appropriate. Another point, I guess, under this is when you accept a client request on Facebook, then there's that potential that RNs need to be aware that if they provide health-related advice on any social media platform, it could extend professional liability in relation to that advice. Um, according to CMPS, as soon as you answer the telephone, text, post, or offer health advice, you have entered into a duty of care and must meet all expectations related um, to that advice, example through doing documentation, maintaining privacy and confidentiality. So these are things to consider when accepting a friend request. So CRNNL also has a document on social media and on, in that document we define social media as a group of ever-changing online um, tools such as Facebook, blogs, LinkedIn, Tweet, tweeting, which is Twitter, texting, online chat forms, or YouTube that facilitate online relationships and information sharing. And I guess uh, an issue with social media or a challenge is that most of these social media platforms were never developed as professional tools 
So transplanting them into our professional environments require careful consideration and being conscientious uh, when you participate in those. And when you hold yourself out as a registered nurse on these platforms, what are the implications for that? So then my next reflection that I have here is my social media and online presence is important. And RNs and MPs are re accountable uh, that that they are aware of the entirety of their social media presence and what that reveals about your clients, your practice and yourself must be considered. Because if you acknowledge a client on Facebook, you may be breaching privacy and confidentiality because the, then the public can see that yes, indeed, you have provided treatment for this client um, and then that opens up the risk of breaches of privacy and confidentiality. And we have to be careful of what we post on social media because it could undermine the public trust and belief about the integrity of the profession and as for you as an individual uh, registered nurse. And it's important that we, that anything that you post on social media platforms should be something that you would say or could say publicly. And another thing to think about um, with your social media presence is that universities and employers are now asking for your social media accounts. So think about your taglines on, on Twitter or your email account names such as, you know, is it appropriate? Reflect on, does it demonstrate a professional presence? If you have your tagline or your email address as um, hashtag sexy, um, sexy chick um, or sexychick.com is your email address, hotnurse at yahoo.ca. RNs and MPs must recognize that practice and ethical standards apply equally to online activities as to practice settings. So really important that we reflect on um, this. Um, social media, friend or foe. And I would say um, it could be one or the other. Um, as you can see in these posts, we, we engage in these, particularly uh, the younger generations, my generations are, are, mm -hmm. are, have some challenges sometimes navigating these, but certainly with the, with the younger generations, we use um, Snapchat and Instagram, LinkedIn, Twitter and Facebook. And social media, as you can see, takes on many forms, but long gone are the days when there's no photographic evidence of all the things that we did as teenagers or as professionals. Um, because it could be posted to one of these um, platforms and then it can be shared. So as I said, um, we have a social media document and I guess the main thing that we can take away from our expectation um, that we can take away is that nurses must be prudent and conscientious. Um, they can enjoy the per personal and professional benefits of social media. Um, if they are conscientious about not violating client, professional, employer, or legal requirements for maintaining privacy, confidentiality, and maintaining a professional presence. And in that document, there's a number of strategies that will um, help you safely and effectively navigate the online world. CMPS also um, has a um, document on uh, their website. It's an info law and it's called social media that outlines the social media risks. Now you can see in this picture, um, this format is a little different. CNPS has just updated their website, www.cnps.ca. So the info laws look a little different, but the content is the same. And so it would be um, prudent to review their info law um, because it's legal advice. These are our liability protection um, insurance or insurers and they give legal advice in engaging in social media. So why is it that as registered nurses, nurse practitioners, our social media presence is important? Well, it is important to consider the entirety of our social media presence because as registered nurses and nurse practitioners, we are held to a higher standard. Um, we have a because of our uh, greater depth and breadth of education, knowledge, and experience within the healthcare setting, because we have a code of ethics and we have standards of practice, and because nursing is a, a, a trusted profession, then we have to be aware of our um, social media presence and recognize um, 
that our practice and ethical standards apply equally um, to our um, professional standards and our, um, and our ethical activities. So Michelle mentioned that, um, you know, the, your online presence is important because it can undermine trust in the profession. So I would like just to talk a little bit about the impact of behavior of how the impact of behavior of individuals can represent um, or can be perceived as being represent, represented of the whole profession. So in this picture, we have um, two lifeguards and they are sitting on their lifeguard station and they are both looking down at uh, their cell phones. Um, and there's two um, you know, people on the beach looking up at them. So these two lifeguards, this may have been just one moment in their 12 hour day. Um, they, you know, they had no idea that somebody was snapping a picture of them or that this picture was going to be shared. But this was coming from um, a park in Quebec and it was a photo taken just from the internet and it happened in uh, July. Um, and what happened is that this picture got posted along with a story that had a headline um, stating that there was an increased number of drownings at this beach. So what does the story tell you about the professionalism of these two lifeguards um, and the outcome of this picture was that people started not going to this beach because even though it was only two lifeguards on the beach that were looking at their phone, um, they considered that the beach may not be the safest for them to take their family members to because the lifeguards weren't watching the water. Um, and even though it was only two lifeguards, they actually represented all the lifeguards on the beach um, with this one image. So just reflect on if you saw this and saw that there was an increased number of drownings at this beach, would you feel safe to take your family member there? Would you feel safe to let your children swim there? So the impact of these two individuals was reflecting the entire beach and all the lifeguards at the beach. The thing is that the, the picture actually had nothing to do with the increased number of drownings and um, it was just put in the article and uh, the drownings were happening because people who were using, um, you know, water vehicles weren't wearing life preservers. So everything that you see uh, on the internet and everything that's posted may not be uh, completely accurate or the whole story. So the impact of our nursing behavior. Um, so we have to be mindful of our nursing behaviors and actions as they can impact not only the individual RN, but the nursing profession as a whole. And I hope we've demonstrated that with the lifeguard um, picture. So the impact of the public's perception of the individual RN um, can be reflective of the entire profession. Um, we have to be mindful that professional act practice issues, such as we discussed in the beginning of the presentation, um, they cannot be played out on social media. So if uh, something happens, and we'll demonstrate this a little further on, um, you know, you cannot retaliate uh, on Facebook. Um, and social media, if used inappropriately, could um, possibly undermine the public's trust and confidence or belief in the integrity of the profession. So if you take nothing else from um, this presentation, it's just to think about um, your post and to pause Think about your, um, you know, your professional career and your professional identity and just pause before you make that post. And it's really important because your post uh, leaves an, um, a footprint and once, it, once it's posted, it is nearly impossible to eliminate um, and it is retrievable. Even the texts from your cell phones are retrievable once they've been deleted. Um, posting anonymously under a pseudonym does not uh, protect you from bre breaches of privacy and confidentiality or of defamation of character charges. And usually your posts are completely um, unintentional and it's just a single moment in time. Um, and that moment in time, um, you know, could have a, a negative impact on your uh, nursing practice. So just take that second to pause before you post. 
So as a nurse, your actions matter. At work, you are responsible to act professionally and be accountable for your own practice. But as we have demonstrated, if you are recognizable as in RN, um, that's very difficult to separate um, on social media. So you are at work, although you're responsible to act professionally and accountable, um, if you do post something on social media and are recognized as a nurse, you can um, be, you can be um, conduct on becoming of a registered nurse. Um, you have to think about your own personal life, your own context, your own circumstances. There is no um, simple rule to follow. We just say to use your best judgment and to con carefully consider any behavior that might impact your per personal and professional image. So just make sure that you do really do that pause before you post. So like Michelle said, you know, social media is a friend and it can be a foe and it can be both. Um, so, but I'm just going to give you a story about the positive impact of social media by a couple of nurses who really, you know, reflected on their nursing practice and their behavior and didn't play out any professional practice issues or, um, you know, personal issues. Um, you buy using social media. So the first person there is um, a lady from the Miss America pageant and she came out for her talent as a nurse um, and she came out with her scrubs on and a stethoscope around her neck and she clearly articulated um, you know that the, the, the work that nurses do, the ability to uh, use critical thinking and to have a positive impact on um, the healthcare system and the, the clients that enter the system. And um, so this was her talent portion of the Miss America pageant. The next day, a, a local talk show, um, you know, said they said some um, interesting remarks about her, um, saying that she shouldn't come out with a stethoscope around her neck because she wasn't a physician and nurses don't do anything with stethoscopes and um, and false information like that. However, this nurse. Um, and then this was followed up on social media and Instagram and, you know, it went viral. Um, but this nurse, uh, even though she was named in the, in the TV show and everybody knew her from the Miss American pageant, she did not play out. She did not respond to um, the comments using social media. Uh, she went through the proper chain of command. Um, and she had a really positive impact because she used this as an opportunity to educate the public about the valuable contributions that RNs make in the everyday in the hospital setting, how they're critical thinkers, how, um, you know, th that nurses often complete head to toe physical assessments and use, um, you know, use stethoscopes on a regular basis. The other um, picture there is of the Utah nurse who was arrested for using to uh, take blood from a patient. So this RN was in the media because um, she had a patient who came in through the emergency room um, and there was some suspicion that the, the patient may have been under the influence of drugs or alcohol and the police officer asked her to take blood to confirm. The patient said, no, uh, don't, do not give my consent. So this RN um, refused to take blood from the patient because she did not have consent to do so. So she upheld the public's trust in the profession of nursing in that, you know, you cannot be forced to do things and that nurses will stand by you if you do not give your consent. And again, she um, did not uh, play out this situation on social media. Um, she did, she used the proper channels um, to deal with this situation. And as a result of this, um, some laws have been changed. So she had a really positive impact. So now I'm going to show you some examples where, where social media can be an example of a foe or have a negative impact on the image of nursing. Um, so in this example, um, that I have here. This was a picture of uh, an Instagram post um, that was posted um, by a New York City RN. And the picture captures an empty but messy ER room. And her tagline was, hashtag man versus sex train. 
And this emergency room had been used to treat a man who had been hit by the number six subway train in New York City. And a consequences of this post was that um, this nurse was found guilty for a breach of privacy. So we had to reflect on in this post was what was the, uh, the purpose um, for posting this, this picture and, and who was the post serving. So it, again, it may have been a, a moment in time. It may not have been intentional. There's no client specific information given here. There's no hospital specific information given here. But the impact was that it was detrimental for the, for the family. And that because of this post, and um, it was identified that this was the room um, that cared for this family's um, loved one who had been killed. And so through this post, um, privacy and confidentiality um, was breached and the nurse was fired um, because of it. And so uh, we have to be mindful um, that you know, what was the purpose? Was this the purpose of the RN to, um, you know, just make a statement of how busy um, our, their work life was or how traumatic it is to caring for patients that um, have trauma? Or, um, you know, was there um, the purpose of identifying a professional practice issue in the, um, the emergency room? So nurses and nurse practitioners uh, RNs and nurse practitioners have to be mindful um, that professional practice issues should not be played out in social media, and Peggy has mentioned this. There is a chain of command within the employment center that um, that needs to be followed. So, you know, you can go to your manager, to your director, um, you know, to your chief nurse. There's quality and risk. There's professional practice. You even have legal counsel. Um, in your uh, uh, practice settings, in some practice settings. And, you know, and a good example of this is, um, as Peggy said, uh, you can't um, retaliate and post anything in Facebook. Um, there's, you know, we've heard of nurses having negative uh, posts um, on Facebook about them and the care that they provided. But if you respond, you're acknowledging that you've cared for this individual. And so, um, Privacy and confidentiality could be um, compromised. So it's just something to reflect on when you're making those posts. Is it in the best interest of the client? What's the purpose of the post? Who and is like, serving? Like we said earlier, this was just probably a moment in time. It was probably a traumatic night for the RN, and she was thinking, oh my gosh, look at all the good stuff that we did, and we worked so well together as a team, and look all the, you know, and snapped a picture. But if you have to pause before you you post it because this is an image now that the family has been left with about their you know loved one um, and it's it's an image that they you know they really didn't need to see so the next one is the consequences of posting on social media as an RN and MP and this is a recent one to do with the COVID-19 um, pandemic and an Ontario nurse practitioner is currently under an investigation after she made posts about um, an anti um, about anti vaccines, saying you know there you shouldn't take vaccines uh, for COVID, and that COVID is a comp conspiracy theory. And this uh, nurse practitioner works as a provincial long term care inspector, and um, she used social media to spread health misinformation, uh, including. Uh, the COVID vaccine, she uh, made statements that um, vaccines cause autism um, and um, that the coronavirus, excuse me, pandemic is a conspiracy um, whose threat to public health has been exaggerated. Mandating masks is irresponsible, negligent, and dangerous. So there's been a lot of, I guess, um, pushback. Um, by some of the, you know, advocacy groups in Canada, and one in particular stated that it's deeply concerning um, when we see healthcare professionals providing information which is not evidence-based. Um, so it's really important um, that we have to reflect on, um, you know, when we're putting something something out there on social media and we're holding ourselves out as an RN and MP um, that is evidence-based. Um, it's, you know. It's current, it's trustworthy, it's truthful. Um, so uh, again, reflect on 
um, holding yourself out as, a, as an RN when you, or MP when you're putting something on social media. So the next picture is um, an example of when you post health advice on social media. And the second picture is of uh, Dina Churchill. She's a chiropractor in Nova Scotia, and she's facing 15, 15 counts of, uh, or allegations of professional misconduct on becoming a, a chiropractor. Because she made extensive posts um, that discredited uh, vaccines. She had discredited views of vaccines. She had unfounded cancer therapies and other uh, subjects outside of her scope of practice. And you have to think about, was her post in the best interest of the client or the public? Um, elderly people follow the advice of health professionals and view them um, in esteem. And um, because they saw her as a doctor, then, um, then they would view her as being an expert. And you know the general public would probably follow her advice because they, they view her as a, as a doctor and would have that knowledge. But, um, you know, it's really important um, that when you put health advice out there, that is evidence-based. So some of the other things that she talked about was that um, vaginal steaming um, was, um, you know, would help in uh, treating sexually uh, transmitted uh, infections, um, that they would help in um, sexual trauma. So, you know, we had to reflect on um, is that evidence-based or is that myths or misinformation uh, um, that is being posted to the website? So we had to be very conscious that what we put out there is evidence-based. The next, um, I guess, tagline or what we really want you to take away um, from this um, presentation is pause before you post. And this picture is of um, a congresswoman in the United States. And um, recently in, uh, uh, in 2019, uh, this um, congresswoman, uh, Alexandra or Queso um, Cortez, uh, had posts made against her on social media. And they were by two members of the police department in uh, New Orleans. It was after, um, President Donald Trump um, made some comments about a couple uh, female congresswomen, and the police um, officers posted that uh, Orcaso Cortez was a vile idiot and suggested she be shot. And the other police uh, officer liked the post. So it's, and it's very, I guess, discouraging and disappointing when you read about this to realize that these police officers were um, receiving education on diversity and the use of social media, and they were actually undergoing training at that point in time. But it's really important um, to realize that these individuals were fired for their posts and liking a post. So it's really important here too that, you know, it, they might have defended themselves by saying it was a joke. But whether it was a joke or it wasn't, jo wasn't a joke, it's improper to make a comment like that. Um, and, you know, to insinuate any vile, vile act against an individual or um, anybody at all. Um, and because they like the post, uh, they are pretty much saying ditto. So then the, the next post that we have here is... Um, for you to reflect on is all I did was like a post and, and we kind of alluded to that in the previous one but here is a re is a um, local example of where social media posts can get you in trouble and this was with the um, St. John's lawyer Bob Buckingham who was suing the provincial government um, the, uh, pro the um, Department of Justice and Public Safety and four cabinet ministers for defamation so there was a change in the Legal Aid Act, which removed a legal aid client's option to choose a um, private practice lawyer. And Mr. Buckingham, uh, you know, made uh, statements on, on uh, the radio that, you know, he thought this was wrong. Um, and then Mr. Parsons tweeted that Mr. Buckingham was motivated by his own self-interest and taxpayers dollars going into his pocket. So this statement was made on Twitter. And it was liked by the other ministers. And because the statement could 
uh, potentially lower Mr. Uh, Buckingham's reputation as a barrister and solicitor, he is suing the government for defamation. And his claim is for $5 million in damages and $2.5 million for punitive and aggravated damages. So um, should the comments have been made in person to the individual, uh, do them in private, um, you know, so, or should it have been, um, you know, inside the appropriate chain of command or authority within the government that, you know, this change was made and what the impact could do. Could do. So it was made an issue in, in the um, social media uh, world and then became a, uh, a major issue because the person felt that he had been defamed. And it affected his career. Right? Absolutely. So we got to reflect on, even though these are um, not a healthcare, um, you know, example, but we have to be mindful that those things that we post in social media can have a, a consequence. So Peggy's going to now uh, further uh, give you some um, P's and Q's, I guess, of social media and what we should think about when we're engaging in social media. Um, and even just right before I start this, when we were giving the examples, it was examples from different professionals. And I just wanted to highlight how, um, you know, the comments that were coming from these different professionals, um, you know, if they were coming from somebody who wasn't a police officer or who wasn't a, a judge or who wasn't a nurse or who wasn't a doctor, then the comments wouldn't be held in such, um, uh, such high regard. Um, you know, if it was just somebody saying that, you know, um, who didn't have the knowledge, skills and abilities um, that, you know, vaccines are ineffective, then, you know, people probably wouldn't follow that advice. But it is it is because professionals are held to that higher standard that it becomes the issue. You would not expect uh, a police officer to say that somebody should be shot because they have a, a different uh, opinion. Yes. And as registered nurses. We have a standard, standards of practice and code of ethics that define our expectations for practice. And so we have to adhere to those. Um, and one of those is knowledge-based practice is that we use evidence-based knowledge, skills, and judgment. So when we're putting things out, um, you know, that it has to be evidence-based and that we have to be mindful that we're, we're respectful of others and that we don't um, say negative or defaming things in, in the public um, right. domain. So the International uh, Nurses Regulator Collaborative has come out with a document called the Six P's of Social Media Use. And it's really just a reminder for you to be professional, act professional at all times, keep your posts positive. Um, you know, if there's something negative that you need to work out, um, maybe social media is not the place to do it. Um, keep your posts pers person and patient free. Um, but as you can see with some of our examples, even if it is person and patient free, there's still a potential for breaches there. Uh, make sure that you protect yourself, your professionalism, your reputation. Um, privacy, keep your personal and professional lives separate and respect the privacy of others. Um, so if you do something in your professional environment, it might violate the privacy of somebody else um, if, it's, it, if it can be linked. So just make sure to do that. Pause before you post. What's the intention of my post? So like I said, um, social media um, in our document, there are opportunities for social media that can be positive. Um, but it is our responsibility to understand its nature and its benefits and the consequences of its use. And just to manage um, the personal and professional risk and just to be knowledgeable about it. So Peggy, I'd just like to, to uh, iterate that we're saying that there could be um, positive, um, po you can use social media positively, you, um, and you have to be mindful that um, when you're engaging in it, that there are risks, but if you can manage those, then, then that's okay. Yeah, and it's part of your reflective practice. Now, with that, though, I just want you to remember that there's always an intention behind a message. So what you see um, might not be the full story. So not everything you see is perfect. Um, so there's lots of fake news out there. There's lots of stories um, that, you know, they have all the positive parts of the story, but you don't know the entire background. 
So if you don't know the background or, you know, if something seems to be too perfect, then maybe you shouldn't share it um, because you really don't know where it's coming from or maybe you shouldn't like it. You have to think about, um, you know, the context that that's being posted, uh, posted in and what you actually know about what you're liking or what you're sharing. So there are, there are some strategies to safely and effectively navigate the online world. Uh, in your employment setting, make sure that you review policies and the standards that they have to guide social media use and your electronic practices. Review those best practice guidelines. Um, in, you know, have an open dialogue with your colleagues around opportunities and challenges for social media. Um, continue to participate in educational events such as this one just to help bring that awareness um, of the risk uh, of social media use and risk management strategies and main, maintaining awareness of the entirety of your social media presence and how that can impact your clients, how it can impact you, and how it can impact your profession. So I'd just like to jump in here. One of the questions we get a lot about is, should we be texting like the physician, the resident, the nurse practitioner? Um, and really important, as Peggy says, that you know what your employer policies are on texting and social media. Um, you know, you have to reflect on is that text going to become part of um, the health record, the client's health record? Um, is the device that you're using is an improved device by the employer? So, and also, can you ensure that you're maintaining privacy and confidentiality? How do we know who's receiving um, that text on the uh, the other end? So, it's really important to use your professional judgment and seek out um, employer policies. And our ends can enjoy personal and professional benefits of social media if they remain prudent and conscientious. So should I accept a friend request on Facebook? Um, so think about what we've discussed and, you know, think about if you encounter this, what will you do? So hopefully we've given you the evidence to be able to make an informed, an informed decision if you're faced with this um, situation. And the other thing about um, accepting friend requests, think about boundaries. It is the RN who is the one who is accountable to establish um, and to end a, um, a relationship. So it is your professional responsibility to not accept a friend request. The, uh, it, uh, from a client um, if they're a client at the time. Yes, because there is that power differential and that, you know, the client may not know that is not appropriate to, you know, be sending a friend request. So the to, RN yeah. is responsible and accountable to say that, you know, um, you're a client or I was a, a healthcare uh, practitioner looking after you um, and that you're now discharged and maybe it might not be appropriate. Um, and if we, if I do accept the request, then it's only from a personal perspective, not from a professional perspective. So you have to really reflect on. And, you know, if you have questions, give us a call. Or you can every call. situation is different. So Absolutely. you can always call us. Absolutely. Or you can check with CMPS, uh, the Canadian Nurses Protective Society, or your own um, manager or professional practice consultant to um, seek out, um, you know, uh, employer policies or what your professional obligations are. So we thank you for um, your attention today. If you do have any questions, uh, you can look us up on the CRNNL website um, and we are available and all of our documents that we have um, mentioned today are in our document library. Just as a, a last reflection, your practice matters. Um, so we look forward to the next one. Thanks guys. Bye.